there online campus. We are so excited to be worshiping with you this morning. It is the last day of July, Crazy. and it has just been such an incredible summer. It really has been an awesome summer, both in my life and around here at Rolling Hills. So Kathy, tell us a little bit about how you've seen God move in your ministry as the counseling director this summer. Oh, it has just been absolutely incredible what God has done. We have seen him restore marriages. We have just seen hope. Um, we've seen healing. One of the my favorite stories is many of us saw Barbara baptized last week, right? Mm -hmm. By her granddaughter. She started in grief share. She had lost her husband. Mm -hmm. She accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior, baptized, and now she's going to be leading one of our care wow. groups this upcoming fall. How about you? How have wow. you seen the Lord work here online? Yeah, well, well that is awesome, yep. Kathy. You do such a great oh. job of leading that ministry, and that's a great story. And yes, here online, we've had a great summer too. Um, my favorite part has been being a part of our women's online group and helping lead that as well. Just seeing so many ladies from different walks of life, different stages of life as well, and even different areas of the country. So talking through our Bible study each week, staying connected through our Facebook group, getting to pray with one another and, and walk, al walk alongside each other with some kind of hard things that some of us may be walking through. So it was a really special summer, summer being a part of that. And I also wanted to take a moment to invite you ladies to be a part of our midweek online groups, which are launching this fall, starting September 7th. And like I said, it has been one of the, my very favorite parts of online ministry and just getting to know you ladies. So I invite you to be a part of it. We've got two Zoom group opportunities for this fall, and hopefully that allows for any of you to have some flexibility if in your schedule, if the midday group didn't work too well for you all. So we will still be offering that midday group at 12 p.m. Central Time, but we also have an evening session as well at 6 p.m. Central Time. And we'll keep up with that Facebook group throughout the week, um, but the Zoom group is also really special just because you get to talk with each other and get to know one another face-to-face -face as well. So we'll be walking through the Encountering God study by Kelly Minter. I've heard it's an incredible study, so you don't wanna miss it. All the details and registration is at our website at rollinghills.church slash women. So ladies, I just invite you to be a part of this study this fall and just see what God can do in your life through the community that we're building here online. Absolutely. Ladies, jump in and be a part of those online groups. And as I'm here this morning, I just want to remind you all, if you haven't heard already, how much we care about each mm -hmm. and every one of you. And we recognize that many of you are walking through difficult seasons, facing trials, facing suffering, and we want you to know that we have a place for you, and we love you, and we wanna walk alongside you. So this fall, we're launching Care Nights, which is, we have, we have care groups, which are our support groups, mm -hmm. and we have a place just for you, no matter what you're navigating. So if you're local, we would love for you to join us. And if you're not, I would love to connect with you. So email me, you can email Chloe, or submit a prayer request. I would love nothing more than to be able to walk alongside you today. You can also visit rollinghills.church care to find out more about those care connection points. That's right, we would love to pray with you this morning. We'd love to get you connected with some care opportunities as well. You can also hop into our online chat, let us know, and you can connect with an online host there who can pray one-on-one -on -one with you as well. So let us know how we can be praying for you this morning. And also, there's other ways that you can take next steps in your faith journey here at Rolling Hills, one of those being our online Explore class. And so whether this is your very first Sunday or whether you've been joining us for months or even years online, the Online Explorer class allows you to learn more about what Rolling Hills is all about. So I also urge you, if you have been attending Rolling Hills online for a few months, a few years, a few weeks even, and you feel like this is your church home, this is the way that you can become a partner, which is what we call our members here at Rolling Hills, online as well. You are our, part of our church family, and we would love for you to make a commitment and become a partner here at Rolling Hills. So head to rollinghills.church slash explore. It's a special opportunity for you to get connected online there. Absolutely. We want to see you take that next step. So jump in, ask any questions, hop in that online chat. We have hosts there. We have other community members there who would absolutely love to hear from you. All right, well, let's get ready to worship together today. We're so glad that you're here.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church this morning. Why don't we stand to our feet? We're going to worship the King together in this place. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So let your heart be free. Worship. Sing to Him, for great is the Lord and worthy to be praised, right? Come on, let's put our hands together. Come on. Yeah. Out of the shadows, step out of the grave. Break into the wild and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is waiting. director and we are so excited that you're joining us for worship this morning hey let's just take a moment to greet the people around you hey if you're online jump in the chat right now and introduce yourself what a beautiful noise you may be seated when you came in this morning, you received a worship guide. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we would love for you to take a moment and fill out the connection card at the bottom. This gives us the chance to reach out to you, to connect with you, and to best resource you. You can drop those in the offering basket later in the service. 
On the back is a place for you to share your prayer requests. No matter what you're going through, it is a gift to be able to pray with you and to pray for you. Our staff prays over these every single week. This morning, later in the service, we're going to be taking communion together. When you came in, you received the elements. And if you are worshiping with us online, hey, take a moment, run to your pantry, grab those crackers and those goldfish and that water and that juice so you'll be ready when that time comes. It's the last day of July. Can you believe it? (laughs) Summer is winding down, but that means that groups are about to start back. We were created for community. And we have so many opportunities for you to find that here at Rolling Hills. We want to invite you to join us for Group Link, which is happening after each service on October 14th and October 21st. This is a time for you to find out more about the community groups, the midweek groups, the care groups that are being offered right here. We have a special place just for you. Ladies, we have a special night coming up on August 25th, Invited. This is going to be an incredible time of food, fun, fellowship, and worship. We're going to be hearing from some of our ladies about what God has done and is doing in their lives. And so we want to invite you, and we want you to invite your friends and your family and your coworkers and your neighbors and whoever God has laid on your heart. That registration is going to close August 11th. We hope that you will join us. This morning, we are continuing in our master class series, and Pastor Jeff is going to be leading us through Mark 15. We also are going to be celebrating baptism. Madeline is joined by Mom Lindsay and her small group leader, Ashley, and Caitlin is joined by our women's director, Miranda, as they take their next step of following Jesus through baptism. Turn your attention to the screens. Okay, hi, my name is Lindsay Maddock, and I'm here with my daughter Madeline and her small group leader, Ashley Griffin. Miss Ashley and her husband, Mr. Ben, have been instrumental in Madeline's coming to accept Jesus. Madeline, we are so proud of your decision to choose Jesus. Madeline, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. It is my honor and privilege as your sister in Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, church. My name is Miranda Cox, and I'm the women's director here at Rolling Hills, and this is my sweet friend, Caitlin Clemmer. And Caitlin is a leader at our gathering, which is Women's Bible Study, and as God has just been working on her heart, she was sprinkled as a baby or as a child, and she just realized that um, she wanted to follow Jesus and just be obedient and follow his example of immersion. So, With that being said, Caitlin, do you trust Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's all stand together and continue worship. You know, what we just saw was a miracle, right? Because only God can change a heart. Only God can change a heart. Can we give him praise this morning for what he does in our lives? Yes, Father. The psalmist says in Psalm 121, I look to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord God who created the heavens and the earth. It says that the Lord never sleeps. He's continually watching over us even when we face our biggest challenges. And I don't know about you guys, but I've had a few in my life. We all have. And every single time, God is faithful. We sing Waymaker, not because it's a great song, which it is, and not because we like it, but we do. We sing it because we believe it, you guys. And let's sing this out together because we believe He is the Waymaker, the Promise Keeper, the light in the darkness. He is 
here working right now. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness.
was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time And sin separated The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You held me Glory to He. 
Father, thank you so much. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We love you for what you've done on the cross for us, God. Lord, we couldn't do it ourselves, so you sent your son. Thank you, Jesus. For you have washed us white as snow. We were so stained, but you washed us white as snow. Thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord for your abounding, unconditional love for us, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. How can we not give it all to you because of what you've done? So we lay it all here at your feet this morning. We lay it all down. We surrender it all to you, for it is so much better in your hands than in ours. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. We love you, Jesus. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, Rolling Hills Church family. It is so good to be together today. Welcome everybody here at our Franklin campus. Welcome to everyone who's joining us online, wherever you're joining from. I pray today God would speak to you, and I am so thankful that we get to be here together. And welcome back to our series. Man, we're this incredible series called Masterclass, a study of the Gospel of Mark. And we have been walking chapter by chapter through Mark, and it is so deep and so rich. In fact, if you've missed any weeks, I encourage you to go back and watch. You know, maybe when you're driving, don't watch when you're driving, but when you're on a treadmill or running or working out, but you're going to listen. But man, for us to just grow, because he is our master, right? And we're taking a class, learning how to be disciples of his. And so we're walking through Mark, and we're just seeing God's word come to life. And, And today, we're kind of coming to the climax Right, we've been, it's 14 weeks, and today's week 15, and next week's the last week in this series. But man, today, you're going to just see it all come to fruition. You're going, whoa, this is what it's all about. All 14 chapters are leading up to today, to today. And I'm so excited about that, because you see, in Mark 1 through 14, Jesus comes to this earth, right? He comes to this earth, and we've seen him do these miracles. We've seen lives being changed. We see him healing people. We have seen his teaching. He taught as one who had authority, not like the teachers of the law that day, with all this wisdom, and you're just going, oh, this is so good, so good. And and we see the crowds, the crowds that are following Jesus. Man, wherever he would go, it's like this rock star, right? People are coming around, and you would get teaching, and he's getting pushed to the edge of the water. You would have to get in a boat to teach because there's so many crowds wherever he went. And we saw this, which was so interesting in Mark, where there would be times we would heal somebody and he would say, hey, hey, don't say anything, right? Don't tell them who who it was who healed you, you know? And you're thinking, well, why is that? Because there's other times he would heal people and he would say, go tell everybody, go tell everybody, right? And we noticed that when he was with the Jewish people over here, he was saying, hey, my time has not yet come. Don't tell anybody yet. Hold on, hold on. And he was with the Gentiles. He'd go across the other side of the Sea of Galilee and the capitalists and the Greeks and the Romans. He would say, go tell everybody, right? So when the church comes, people are ready. They're like, oh, the Messiah. Yeah, right. He's, he's the one. But we've seen him with the Jews going, don't say anything yet because my time is coming. And now the time has come. When we get to Mark 15, this is why Jesus came. And so we're seeing the climax today. And it is so good. And I am so glad that you're here. So if you have a Bible with you today, I invite you up with me to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. So you got these four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all give a different perspective, right? It's like a different camera angles watching the same event. And you're going, oh, these incredible insights. And we've been walking through Mark and just seeing all this unfold. And Mark was written really to a Roman audience. There was a lot of action immediately, immediately. All these things that would happen with Jesus and his intentionality to every detail. And so we saw last week, Pastor Chase did a great job in Mark 14, talking about this. You saw Mary, Mary who anointed Jesus at Bethany, preparing him, right? 
And Jesus comes into to Jerusalem, right? And there's this big celebration. And, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So preparing him for the, all that's going to happen. We, we saw Judas betray Jesus, one of his own. And if you've ever been betrayed by a friend, you're like, oh, man, I know that feeling. But Judas betrays him, betrays him. And, and then we see he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's taken before the Sanhedrin. We, we see Peter. Peter, who's one of his closest friends, denies him three times. It's like, oh, man, it just gets worse. It gets worse. And then you come, chapter 15, and it says, Very early in the morning, the chief priest with the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin. So that's the Jewish ruling class, okay? These were the leaders for the Jews, Pharisees, Sadducees together. They come, and they made their plans. And so they bound Jesus, and they led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Now, Pilate is the Roman governor of Judea. So you know Rome is over this entire area. So you got Caesar Augustus, who's kind of over the entire empire. And then you had these governors in different regions. And Pilate is over this region. And the Romans had learned from the Greeks. When the Greeks conquered this area, you know, the Greeks went in and they, you know, sacrificed a pig on the altar and the Jews revolted. They kicked the Greeks out. And so the Romans, when they had control of this area, they said, hey, you guys can worship how you want to. It's all right. You can have your ruling class. That's fine. You can keep your law. You can go to the temple. But you can't kill anybody, okay? All that stuff's going to go through the Romans. And so here the Sanhedrin brings Jesus. Now they tried him at night, which was against their law, number one. Two, they couldn't find any charge against him except that he said, I'm the son of God. <laughs> and they said, that's blasphemy. So they hand him over to Pilate. And Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. Yep, here I am. I'm the Messiah, the one everybody's been waiting for. And I want you to see this because this is an incredible kind of plot twist, right? Have you ever been reading a good book and then you're like, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming, right? You're like, oh, man, you know, you watch a movie. I remember Sixth Sense. You know, it's like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. You know, it's, like, it's all these kind of times you're like, I didn't see that. Or maybe you have a surprise party and you're like, oh, I should have known. But then all these people are there. You're like, wow, I thought we were just having this nice dinner. But, but there's this thing that you're like, all of this has been leading up. But the people wanted a political messiah. They wanted somebody who was going to overthrow the Romans. And yet what Jesus was doing was so much more. Jesus was coming not just to change circumstances. Get this. Jesus was coming to change hearts. Jesus was coming to make things right with God for every person. And what you're going to find right here is Jesus isn't on trial. Pilate's on trial. And every one of us. I am the son of God. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to believe the chief priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Pilate was amazed. Now we know Pilate's wife from the other Gospels has this dream, a woman's intuition, right? And she says, hey, have nothing to do with this man. He's an innocent man, right? And so Pilate's caught here. He, he doesn't know what to do. And so he, he comes up with this idea, right? Because it was the custom at the festival, the Passover festival, to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionist who had committed murder in the uprising. And the crowd came up and they asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So Pilate's thinking, hey, I got this great idea, right? I'll give them this murderer guy, right? And I'll put him up against Jesus and this way I can get out of it, right? They'll release Jesus, everything will be fine, it'll work out. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify, crucify the same crowd that had chanted, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as he came in to Jerusalem now a week later. Crucify, crucify. And then verse 15. And man, I don't know if you ever underline your Bible, but man, this, this just verse gets me. Wanting to satisfy the crowd. How many times in our life, right? Wanting to satisfy the crowd. Oh, you'll be cool. You'll be popular, right? And come on, everybody's going to like you, right? Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Now, a lot of times in Scripture, we'll kind of read, and we just kind of skip over, oh, you had Jesus flogged. But, 
But being flawed back then, I mean, literally, right? You, you, your, your clothes are taken off and you're stretched out on this pole and these two Roman soldiers with a cat of nine tails and with bone and glass and they would whip and the back and it would grab in and pull. And 40 lashes, a person wouldn't make it. They wouldn't survive, right? And so 39 lashes and many people never survived the flogging. But Jesus is flawed and then he's handed over to be crucified. We know if you keep reading, the soldiers mock him, right? A crown of thorns on his head. Purple robe, here you are, king of the Jews, right? We know if you keep going that he now has to carry the cross, 75 pounds, right? Through the streets of Jerusalem and he falls at one point. And Simon of Cyrene, this guy who's coming for the Passover, and he's the father, it tells us, of Alexander and Rufus, who we see mentioned later on in the book of Romans. They, they become followers of Jesus after the resurrection, right? But, but he carries the cross up to Golgotha. It says in verse 25, it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Crucifixion, they would put the nail not in the hand because that would tear, but they would put it in the wrist between those two bones. And the person is nailed to this cross beam and then lifted up and dropped in the ground and a nail was then put in the feet. And you would literally have to breathe by pushing up on that nail and over time the blood loss and people would die a, a slow death. It was painful and it was hard. And it says that there were two thieves that were crucified on either side of Jesus. And one on his right and one on his left. And, and one of the thieves mocked Jesus. The other thief was like, no, 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 no. This guy's innocent. And we deserve to die. We've messed up, right? But he's not, hey, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus. And Jesus goes, today you'll be with me in paradise. And they come to verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Now, we know from even secular historians that this phenomenon happened. I mean, from noon to three, it was pitch black all throughout the land. And nobody knew what was going on, just total darkness. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, leme sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, think about this. In that moment, Jesus takes on the entire sins of the world. All the sins. So now you've got a holy God, and now you've got Jesus. And right, think outside the confines of time. Your sin, my sin, Jesus took it on in that moment on the cross. And now the Father separated from the Son because of our sin. Look down at verse 37. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Okay, guys, th think about this moment right here, right? The, the curtain in the temple divided the Holy of Holies. Where only one time a year the high priest would go to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the whole nation, right? It, and there was a curtain that separated. This curtain is 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and a hand, man's hand thick. It took 300 priests to put up this curtain. And it separated the presence of God from then you got the place where all the priests would come, you know, the holy place there. Then you had the court of the men, the court of the women, Jewish men, Jewish women. You had the court of the Gentiles out here. That's what the temple was like. You have this giant curtain who separates God from everybody else. And in that moment when Jesus died, the curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. 60 feet high. No man's doing that. At that exact moment, what's God saying? I'm making a way to come to you. Wow. Think about that. God's making it so clear. Listen, and when the centurion, this Roman centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. The first confession of faith <laughs> that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the son of God from a Roman centurion. Verse 42 is preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, that's the same council, that's the Sanhedrin, that's the one who handed Jesus over. But this guy knew. He recognized who Jesus was, and he, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. He went boldly. I don't know if you underline, but man, that word boldly. I love this guy, Joseph of Arimathea. 
You know, I mean, he's going, he's identifying with Jesus. And in that moment, right, he's putting his whole career on the line. He's putting all of his, you know, money on the line. He's putting his family, he reputation, he doesn't care. He's like, I know he's the Messiah. I know he's the one we're waiting for. He goes boldly to Pilate and he asks for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that, that he was already dead. Sometimes it would take a, a full day or two days or so as you suffered and summoning the centurion. He asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. The centurion's very life on the line, right? And the centurion had taken a spear and tabbed it into the side of Jesus and blood and water flowed down, hit the sack around the heart. So Joseph brought the, some linen cloth and he took down the body. He wrapped it in linen and he placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. And then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Jesus died on that cross. Paid the price for us on that cross. But it's also not the end. All right, if you're taking notes today, here's some things I'd love for you to write down. If you are here and you have a worship guide, if you're online and you want to pull up the Rolling Hills app, there's a place that you can fill in some blanks. But I want you to see this today, man. This is so powerful for all of us. One, this, the centrality of the cross. The centrality of the cross, right? Look, are you the king of the Jews? Asked Jesus. You've said so. Jesus replied. Everything leading up to this time, this moment. See, Jesus would say, like, I'm not simply a good moral teacher. I, I, I'm not simply a miracle worker or a prophet. I am the son of God. <laughs> what do you believe? Everything in Mark is leading up to this cross. Right? You look back and you can kind of go, oh, now I see it. Right? When you're reading that book and you see that plot twist and you go, oh, I should have gotten those clues along the way. Right? I should have been in that movie. I should have got the clues along the way. I should, I should have known the surprise party was going to happen. I mean, all these things. And it starts to add up. Everything was leading up to this. The entire Old Testament, right? Isaiah, the suffering servant and everything. But people wanted a political Messiah. They wanted a leader who was going to come and overthrow the Romans. <laughs> They were looking for a political person who was going to take care of them, you know, and change their circumstances. When Jesus was changing our hearts in the middle of our circumstances, when Jesus was bringing life and healing and hope, everything is leading up to the cross. This is the time. Hey, look, Jesus is the only person who was born to die. I mean, that's what Jesus came. He came to lay down his life. If you go back in the Old Testament, there's the whole sacrificial system, right? We start reading the Bible, we read the Genesis and Exodus, we're like, oh, this is exciting. We get to Leviticus, we go, oh, Leviticus, you know? Why? Because we start getting into the sacrifices. But there had to be atonement for sin, right? We all sin, we all messed up. You got a holy God, and we're sinful man. And so God said, hey, bring an animal when you come to worship, you know, and sacrifice that animal and pay the price with the blood and so that you can come and be cleansed and be redeemed and you can worship. Well, then you go out and sin again. So you're like, I got another animal, you know. <laughs> I need another animal, right? Here's another animal, another animal, another animal. And here you go, Jesus comes. And what did John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's why Jesus came for us. See, Jesus suffered, and he did. He suffered death for you. He suffered death for you. What held Jesus on the cross that day? It wasn't just those spikes, right? Jesus at any point could have called down a legion of angels from heaven. He could have taken out the Romans if he wanted to. But what held him there was you. What held him there was me. Praise be to God. It tells us in Hebrews, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And I think a joy set before him, what was that joy? It was us. The price had to be paid. And if you were the only person alive and you had sinned, Jesus would have still come. And he would have died just like he did for you. Look at this. The cross means, here's what it means, right? Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And he had Jesus flawed and handed over to be crucified. Think about this guy, Barabbas. He's sitting in his jail cell going, I'm going to be crucified today. That's going to hurt. I mean, like, you know, like, this is like the worst ever. I mean, you know, you can just imagine the anguish. You can imagine the tears. Just imagine like, oh, man, 
I can't believe this. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be crucified. I, I mean, you just can't even imagine what he's going through his mind, right? I mean, my life's over. I am not seeing anybody else, my, my family, friends. I mean, my life is totally over. And in that moment, he's sitting there, and the jailer comes, and the jailer opens the jail and says, you're free. What? Yeah, you can go. What do you mean? No, you're free. You can walk out. There's a guy, Jesus, he took your place. He's going to be flogged. He's going to be crucified. You're free. You can go. That's Barabbas, and that's us. See, the cross means this, that you can be redeemed. Redeemed. You know what redemption is? It means to be bought back, right? God created you, and God created you for a relationship with him. But just like Adam and Eve, we sinned. Right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us has made mistakes. You know, well, you're like, yeah, I get it. Right? I have. I know that. You know, that's not a news flash to any of us. But then God buys us back. God sends his son to pay the price to redeem us. You can be redeemed. Listen, you can be justified with God. You know what justified means? Just as if I. Right? That's justified. Just as if I never sinned. You know, so many times we think God's up there with an iPad just kind of going, oh, yeah, remember that sin? Oh, remember that sin? Wow, oh, yeah. No! What God's doing is he's going, oh, there's my son and my daughter. I love them. Look, Jesus, you, you died for them. <laughs> They're awesome. They're amazing. Look at, look at that. They've been justified because of what, Jesus, you did on the cross for them. They're justified. And listen, you could be forgiven. <laughs> you could be forgiven. God says when you have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ, when you understand that Christ paid the price for your sin, you are forgiven. And God says, I remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. I remember your sins no more. But here's the thing. We still remember them, don't we? And even though God forgives us, sometimes we don't forgive. We don't forgive ourselves. Sometimes we still carry that guilt and that shame. And we go, well, you know what? I'm just a sinner. That's who I am. No, you're not. <laughs> because of the grace of God and what Jesus did on the cross, you are a saint. You are redeemed. You are restored. You're made whole. You're made new. Live with that confidence. Know who God created you to be. God loves you. In 1510, there was a guy named Martin Luther. And Martin Luther grew up in Germany. His dad was wealthy and successful, and so he had a great education growing up, and Martin Luther went to law school, and yet inside he knew there was something missing in his life. And one day he's riding his horse, and a, a lightning struck really close to him, and, and he thought, oh my goodness, I, I got to get things right with God. And so in 1505, he became a monk. And I mean, he goes into the monastery, and he starts beating himself up over all of his past, over all of his sins. And, and there would be times that he wouldn't eat at night. And he'd pray all through the night. He, he was just all the time all over himself. And in 1510, he makes a pilgrimage to Rome. And he goes to Rome and he thinks, I'm just going to get things right with God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there and make this pilgrimage. I'm going to go to Rome. And he gets there and things don't settle well with him, right? He's seeing how the church back then, right, was selling indulgences, which means you can pay money and buy your way out of purgatory or out of hell. He's like, whoa. That doesn't line up, you know? It's not about what we do. And he was seeing all these things that just were incongruent. And then he goes to the holy steps. And the same steps that Jesus walked up to go see Pilate, those steps. And you're thinking, well, how are those steps in Rome? This is Jerusalem, right? Constantine, who becomes the first Christian emperor of Rome, Constantine's mom goes back, she converts to Christianity, and she starts taking relics out of Jerusalem and brings them to Rome. And so those steps, these marble steps, are actually in Rome. In fact, if you go to Rome, I've been there and seen them. You can go and see where these steps are. Well, Martin Luther goes to those steps. He starts crawling up those steps. He's crying. He's so upset over his own sin, his brokenness. And about halfway through or so, he starts to get close to the top, and he stops. And he stands up. He goes, wait a minute. This isn't what it's all about. The righteous will live by faith. Jesus paid the price. I'm not guilty anymore. It's not about what I do. It's about what he's done. And he goes back to Germany, nails the 95 Thesis to the Wittenberg door, and sparks the Protestant Reformation that changed the world. To say, hey, listen, it's the grace of God. Look what Jesus did for 
you. We don't have to live beating ourselves up all the time. We can live in the grace and the goodness of God because of the cross. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. You're justified. That's good news, by the way. All right, look at this. God made him who knew no sin. That's Jesus. He came and he lived a sinless life. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When God looks at you now, he sees righteousness. When God looks at you, he smiles. He's proud of you. You're justified. You're redeemed. Hey, the cross is for all people. It's for all people, right? The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, this Roman centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Guys, I just think about this Roman centurion, just seeing that. I think about the people that were there, the, the thieves on the cross. You think about the women you think about Joseph of Arimathea, this wealthy guy. All of these people, all these people are now seeing what God is doing. See, the cross stands as a moment of commitment for every person. Every one of us have to decide. Every one of us is on trial, just like Pilate. What do we believe about Jesus? Is he truly the son of God? You think about those two thieves, equal distance from Jesus, right? Two totally different responses. One, you are the Messiah, the other one, no way. In every church, right? In every city, in every place, you have to decide. Who is Jesus? Was he simply a miracle worker? Was he simply a great teacher? Or is he truly the son of God, the cross? This calls us to a commitment. Now the cross, it's not a cheap grace. And I believe the gospels tell us what all Jesus endured because the, it's not a cheap grace. Sometimes we sin and we just think, oh, it's no big deal, right? Oh, well, you know, God will forgive me. You ever been there? <laughs> oh, God will forgive me. It's fine. We have to understand that it's our sin that put Jesus on the cross. Last week, somebody filled out a, a prayer request, and I was so thankful for their honesty. But they just wrote, you know, I know what God wants me to do, and I don't want to do it. <laughs> I know it's wrong, but I'm really struggling. Please pray for me. And I thought, man, thank you for being honest. Thank you for being real. How many times have we been there? I know I should reconcile in this relationship. I know I should offer grace. But man, I'm stubborn. I know I should love in my marriage. I know I should love my kids. I, I know I should reach out. I know I should be generous. I know I should be kind. But man, it's me. It, it, and we could so easily fall back into that trap. But it's not cheap grace. It calls us to be different See, the cross is God's way to the kingdom. It's not a way, it's God's way. It's not our idea, it's God's idea. That he would send his one and only son for us. And every person, every person has to make that decision, that commitment to Jesus. A couple weeks ago, we had a team in the Amazon jungle, right? We go down and do missions there, and we have a pastor's conference through Justice and Mercy international and nonprofit that we started. It's amazing. At some point, I'd love for you guys to go. We do boat trips, and you can sleep in hammocks on boats and wake up in different villages and do ministry. We take doctors and nurses, and it's incredible. But we do a pastor's conference, too, every year. And this last pastor's conference, uh, we had a lady who came who is a tribal chief. And one of the pastors had gone in to the deeper regions of the Amazon jungle and, and had told this chief about Jesus. And this chief was so excited that she wanted to come to the pastor's conference and hear more. And so she literally came and she brought a translator with her because they speak Portuguese, but in these native languages, there's this different dialect. And so she brings this translator with her. Well, she gets off the boat. She's got the headdress on. I mean, like, I mean, the kind of the whole thing, right? And she's coming to the conference and, and, and man, they have this incredible time. And at the end of the week, the translator comes up to one of our JMA staff and says, I want what you have. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And right there, she prays and gives her life to Christ. And I was just thinking, how incredible that God is drawing people to himself from the deepest regions of the Amazon jungle. And how incredible that God is drawing each of us. And maybe you feel like you're a number. Maybe you feel like kind of you're left out or you're on the periphery. No, God knows your name. God knows who you are. If he knows those in the deepest regions, he knows you. And he's made a way for you to spend eternity with him. 
Hey, look, the cross is not the end of the story. I love this, right? Mary Magdalene, the faithfulness of these women, and Mary, the mother of Joseph, they saw where he was laid. And they're going to come back. They're going to come back. Jesus is not still on the cross. Mark 15, incredible chapter. Praise be to God. But it's not the end. Mark 16 is still to come. There's more to the story, right? Jesus is not still on the cross. If he were, we could be forgiven, but we would still die, right? We would not have eternal life. There is more to come what Jesus has done for us. The cross shows us the depth of God's grace. Have you ever thought about this, that that somebody died for you? Now, if you're a parent here, you, you get that. You go, man, I would lay down my life for my child. No doubt. I mean, right here, right? I would take a bullet. I would do whatever for my child. But would you die for somebody you didn't know? <laughs> or was mean to you? Or who mocked you? Or said bad things? That's a whole different level, right? When we were at war with God, when we were in our sin, that's when Jesus died for us. That's the depth of God's grace for us. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is. God's riches at Christ's expense. That you've received grace. That you've received love. Think about this. We were Barabbas. We're sitting here. We know we deserve to be separated from God because of our sin. And yet, God says you're free. Jesus paid it all. Look at this. The cross calls us to live for Christ. To live for Christ. We have that freedom, but that freedom calls us to be different. We die to ourselves. We live for Christ every day. How can I love? How can I offer grace? How can I encourage? How can I build up? How can I live because of what I've received? A couple of weeks ago, I saw this picture, and it just really captured the essence of, of this for me. And it was a small church in a small town in Texas. And this church caught on fire. And when the firefighters came and everybody came and, and the fire it was just raging, and when the firefighters arrived, here's what they saw. <laughs> they saw this. <laughs> the entire church building had burned, but the cross stood. And I, I love the people of that church because they all came together and they said, hey, it's okay. The, the church is not a building. We can rebuild. The cross stands, and we're going to worship. And they had a prayer revival service, and everybody in the town came, and they saw the cross. And I thought, isn't that just like history? You know, there have been people who've come and tried to stamp out Christianity. The Romans, right, they persecute the church. If you go read in Acts, and they take, and they take Christians, they feed them to the gladiators and to the lions and the Colosseum. But you know what? If you go to the Colosseum today, there's a cross. <laughs> there's a cross. You think about throughout history and all these times and all these things that have gone against the church and yet the cross. And you think about your life. All the struggles, all the hardships, all the brokenness, and yet the cross. That God is with you. That God is for you. The circumstances will be hard, but God came to change your heart. God came to give you life and life eternal. That God is with you. That God is for you. Whenever you see the cross, think about this. You are loved. Think about this. You are valuable. Think about this, that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to ask you to take out the elements today. We're going to share the Lord's Supper together. If you're here at our Franklin campus and you need the elements, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring those to you right now. If you're online, I want to invite you to go to the kitchen to get some wine, some grape juice, some bread, some crackers. But Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he brought his disciples together. And they're sharing the Passover meal, Right? For 1,500 years, they'd shared the Passover meal. When, the, when God freed his people of being slaves in Egypt, the last plague was the death angel who would pass over. And he said, put the blood over the doorpost of your home and the death angel will pass over. And the firstborn of all the Egyptians died that night. But, but all the Israelites were saved because of the blood. And they come in and they are used to taking a lamb and they're used to being there and, and, 
and slaughtering that lamb and eating that lamb and having the blood and the cups and the herbs. And, and yet when they come in this time, there's no lamb and they're looking around for the lamb. And finally, Jesus goes, I'm the lamb. <laughs> the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in that moment, right there in that moment, Passover ends, the Lord's Supper begins. The law and grace meeting right here. So Jesus took the bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Not just for the whole world. For you. For you. And your sin and your hurt and your pain, God sent Jesus for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. And after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant. My grace poured out for you. You were under the old covenant before, right? You sinned, you had to pay the price. It was you. You're separated from God for eternity. But there's a new covenant of grace. Jesus' blood poured out for us at that cross. Take and drink in remembrance of him. For when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. That we should live in the freedom and the grace of God. That we should live not as sinners, but as saints. That we should live forgiving and offering grace, just like we've received the grace and the forgiveness of God. That we should live as Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace in our lives. Oh, you're an awesome God. Thank you that you're with us when times are hard, that you're with us when times are good, that you are the maker and creator of all, the sustainer of life, and that in your sovereignty, God, you sent your one and only son to pay the price that we should have paid. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the life that Jesus brings. Thank you for the hope that you give. Thank you for the life that is ahead. What an awesome God you are. And I pray today that we could worship. I pray today we would give all glory to you. I pray today that we would know that we are forgiven. And we would even forgive ourselves. And we would live in your love. Because you're an awesome God. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship our great God.
And I just want to say this. If you ever wonder if you're loved, just look at the cross. If you ever wonder, does my life matter? Just look at the cross. If you ever wonder, does God have a plan for my life? Just look at the cross. And there's an awesome God who sent his one and only son because he didn't want to spend eternity without you. You matter to him. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. You are so special to God. You're the apple of his eye. Live in that truth. Live in that confidence and allow it to spill over to everyone around you. I don't know what's going on in your life today, but I know God's here. And I know it's not an accident that any of us are here. That God wanted to meet with us today. After the service, I'll be here. There'll be people on our staff, our prayer team. If you want to talk with somebody or pray with somebody, that's what church is. For us to connect to the awesome God through his son, Jesus, and the cross. Praise be to God. You can be seated right now. This time I want to invite our ushers to come forward. It's a chance for us to give back. You know, our God is so good to all of us, right? And for us to, to give back out of what he's given to us. And I just want to say thank you. Church, your generosity matters. I mean, we've had mission trips, Amazon, Moldova. You're taking care of orphans. You're taking care of kids in our community. You're making a difference right here. And so thank you for your generosity. It matters. Let me pray right now. Father, thank you for an opportunity to give back. God, you've given us so much. You're one and only son. I pray, Father, you would fill us with joy. I fill us with life. Allow us to live in the freedom that we have because the price has been paid. We don't have to live with guilt and with shame. We can live with confidence of who we are in Christ. Thank you for the cross. And thank you for giving so much for us and allow us, Father, to give our lives back to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we give. Amen, amen, amen. Wow, church, what a great morning. Man, our God is good and he is here. And we've had an incredible summer. I can't believe that today is the last Sunday of summer. I mean, it has just gone like that, but it has been awesome. So many mission trips and camps. We just had our fourth and fifth grade students come back. Uh, they were at camp this week, and man, it was awesome to see. They had so much fun, and, and a lot of them accepted Christ. And you're going to be seeing them being baptized in the weeks to come. And so grateful and so thankful for so many leaders who serve and make a difference in this next generation. And you guys, that's what God's doing right here, right now. Next Sunday is Move Up Sunday. And so we're excited about that. All the kids will move up to their new classes. So preschool, children, students. And if you're a parent, you have kids moving into these different areas, but it is great. And if you've been looking for a place to serve and you said, hey, put me in coach, Hey, we could use you in family ministry. So preschool children, students, let us know. You can 
reach out to Chase Baker, our family pastor, or to, to Kenley, to Jen, to John, anybody on our, our staff teams, to Anna, and let us know because you can make a difference in serving with this next generation. But next Sunday is going to be a big Sunday. And so, man, I encourage you just with your kids, if you have kids, to have them here and have a great time next week. Also, I want to encourage you, next Sunday is the end of our master class. So, Mark 16. Spoiler alert, okay? Jesus doesn't stay on the cross, right? Jesus is alive, so we are going to come and we are going to celebrate next Sunday. It is going to be a powerful Sunday, and I can't wait. And so I just want to encourage you, invite somebody to come with you, because it is going to be an awesome time. And if you come normally at 9.30, and you can in your schedule work out to come to the 8 or the 11, that would be incredible. Because as you can see, it's pretty full in here, right? You know, and so it's summer too. And so just, man, if you can figure that out in your schedule and inviting people and all those things, if you can, man, go, hey, it would work out. I can come at eight. I could serve at 930, right? I can help out in different ways. But man, that would take a big help for all of us. God is at work, church. I'm just telling you, we're seeing God move in so many lives. I'm talking to people who've accepted Christ this summer, lives being changed, the missions that's happening. I get so excited about last week seeing this, Young this middle schooler baptizing her grandmother. I'm just like, praise the Lord. You know, it's just, God's raising a generation here, and it's awesome. I'm praying this week, and I would encourage you to, school starts back on Friday. So let's be praying for all the kids who are going back to school, for the parents, for the teachers, for administrators, in public schools, private schools, home schools. But this is a big time of year, and so let's lift them up. Let's stand together. Let me pray for you, over you, and for this new year. God, thank you for your presence today. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that we have hope in the middle of all the things that are going on in our lives. That Jesus, you love us. I do pray for schools that are starting back as a staff. You know, we prayed over a hundred schools, lifted them up to you. I pray for all the kids who are going or nervous. Be with them, be their peace. I pray they would make a difference. I pray you would raise up a generation, Father, of students who would impact this church, this community, this state, this nation, this world for you. I pray revival would come through this next generation. And so, Lord, find us faithful, pouring in, Father, for your glory. Let us be bold, God, and live it all for you. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Thanks for being here. Have a great week. God bless. Friends, what a great morning of worship it has been. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Once again, I want to encourage you to get involved in those online groups or care night or jump into the online explore class. You can email me, you can email Chloe to find out more, to ask questions if you need prayer or let us know other ways that you want to get involved. We love you and we are so grateful for you.